This is the Daily Signal podcast for Friday, August 23rd. I'm Kate Trinko. And I'm Daniel Davis. Conservatives have lost trust in Facebook. That's one conclusion from a new independent report spearheaded by former Senator John Kyle. The report was released this week after Kyle and an assisting law firm interviewed 130 conservative politicians and leaders about their experience with the social media giant. Today, our executive editor, Rob Bluey, speaks to Kyle about that report in an exclusive interview. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave a review or a five-star rating on iTunes, and please encourage others to give it a listen. Now, on to our top news. Job growth hasn't been quite as strong as previously believed. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is now saying around 500,000 fewer jobs were created than previously reported. USA Today reports, quote, The large change means job growth averaged 170,000 a month during the 12-month period, down from 210,000 initially estimated, according to J.P. Morgan Chase. Well, Iran unveiled a new long-range missile defense system on Thursday, the Bavar 373. Speaking in a televised address, President Hassan Rouhani said the new system was an improvement over the Russian S-300. The missiles can detect targets and planes from over 190 miles away. He also dismissed nuclear talks with the United States as being useless and said, quote, Now that our enemies do not accept logic, we cannot respond with logic, end quote. The unveiling of the new system comes after months of heightened tension in the Persian Gulf, in which Iran's Revolutionary Guard shot down a U.S. drone over international waters. Two new military deaths in Afghanistan have brought the number of combat deaths there to the highest number in five years, according to CNS News. In 2015 through 2018, fewer than 14 combat deaths occurred annually. President Trump addressed Afghanistan when talking to reporters earlier this week, saying via ABC News. And if I return to Afghanistan, what is your current thinking on pulling out the United States? Well, we're talking to uh, the government of Afghanistan. We're talking to the Taliban and we're talking to others. And we're looking at uh, different things. We've been there for 18 years. It's ridiculous. We have taken it down a notch. Military veterans who are permanently disabled will soon have quicker access to student loan forgiveness, thanks to a new executive order signed by President Trump on Wednesday. The executive order directs the government to create an expedited process for eligible veterans to take advantage of the already available loan forgiveness, something about only 20 percent of eligible disabled vets have taken advantage of due to the burdensome application process. Speaking at the American Veterans National Convention in Louisville, Kentucky, the president said, quote, The debt of these disabled veterans will be completely erased. That's hundreds of millions of dollars of student loan debt for our disabled veterans that will be completely erased. Former White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders will now be appearing regularly on Fox News. She's joined the channel as a contributor. Sanders is far from the only press secretary to make the jump to cable news. Other former White House press secretaries, including Dana Perino, Jay Carney, and Robert Gibbs, have gone to work for Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC. Well, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is taking heat after calling the Electoral College a scam that has a, quote, racial injustice breakdown. On Monday, the New York Democrat posted a video on Instagram while driving through the desert. The camera showed empty land being passed in the backdrop as she said this. We're coming to you live from the Electoral College. Many votes here, as you can see. Very efficient way to choose leadership of the country. Um, I mean, I can't think of any other way, can you? Well, she went on to say, quote, The Electoral College has a racial injustice breakdown. Due to severe racial disparities in certain states, the Electoral College effectively weighs white voters over voters of color, as opposed to a one-person, one-vote system where all our votes are counted equally, end quote. Well, it wasn't long before major conservatives shot back. Iowa Senator Joni Ernst tweeted, quote, Actually, AOC, eliminating the Electoral College would silence our voices here in Iowa and in many other states across the country. This is just more evidence of how out of touch the Democrats have become, end quote. And former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee tweeted, quote, The great sage AOC apparently didn't take civics, so she wants to get rid of the Electoral College. 
The college we need to close is the one who gave her a degree. Next up, we'll feature Rob Blue's exclusive interview with former Senator John Kyle, who is looking at whether Facebook has a conservative bias problem. Americans have almost entirely forgotten their history. That's right. And if we want to keep our republic, this needs to change. I'm Jarrett Stepman. And I'm Fred Lucas. We host The Right Side of History, a podcast dedicated to restoring informed patriotism and busting the negative narratives about America's past. Hollywood, the media, and academia have failed a generation. We're here to set the record straight on the ideas and people who've made this country great. Subscribe to The Right Side of History on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Stitcher today. I'm joined today by former Arizona Senator John Kyle. He's currently senior counsel at the firm Covington and Burling. Senator Kyle, thanks for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, this week, you released the results of a survey that many people anticipated. It uh, was commissioned by Facebook. Uh, your firm was asked to look into complaints from conservatives about Facebook. Uh, let's begin with that. Uh, what exactly did you set out to do with this survey? Sure. Well, first, a bit of background. Um, they had already engaged um, a person to survey some liberal opinion. They, they called it a civil rights uh, audit, uh, and that work was underway. And they knew that there was a lot of criticism coming from the conservative side. And knowing that I had a, a good rapport with conservatives, having <laughs> been one my whole career in the Senate, um, they thought perhaps I could get a, a good, candid, um, and, and pretty complete assessment of conservative thought which would then better uh, enable them to make decisions about uh, what, if anything, they wanted to do about that. And they were very well aware that a lot of conservatives believed that they were biased against conservatives and that their uh, policies and procedures at Facebook reflected that bias. So they asked me to put together a team at Covington, interview, uh, well, first of all, set up a, a, uh, a form of a questionnaire so that the information that we received was um, was usable by by them. It was consistent, and we did that. And then we identified uh, 133, uh, actually more than that, but we ended up interviewing 133 individuals from the conservative community, not just in Washington D.C., but other places as well, uh, who uh, we either knew had been had expressed uh, criticisms of Facebook, or we. Uh, figured they probably would if we asked. And uh, for a period of uh, over three months, uh, we conducted those those interviews. And then in early August of 2018, we presented our findings uh, to Facebook. Uh, and uh, they were denominated preliminary findings. But uh, based upon the huge number of people that we talked to, we were pretty sure that we got a very good cross-section of views and that what we heard was pretty representative of the conservative community in general. So we presented our findings to Facebook, and then uh, I could discuss what happened thereafter if you're interested. I, I do. I want to get into what those findings are. I do have a couple of other questions, though, just on the process that you took, because I feel that there's maybe some confusion out there. And I saw it firsthand because in the interest of full disclosure, uh, we hosted you for a listening session at the Heritage Foundation in June of 2018 with representatives from several conservative organizations. I know, as you stated in your Wall Street Journal op-ed, you're not naming those 133 organizations or individuals that you spoke to, but it is a sizable number of people that you did receive feedback from. And I'd just like to, to hear more about how you selected them, uh, what you kind of uh, did in terms of collecting that information and packaging it in your initial report to Facebook back in August of 2018. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, you know Bill Wickerman and, and Gabe Neville are part of my team at Covington, and they are very well connected to the conservative community in Washington. And so we sat down and over a period of several days just uh, thought of all of the conservatives who would probably have an opinion on this that we could think of, as well as conservative organizations. We also identified some members of Congress, and um, and then uh, we began our, our interviewing process, and of course, that led us to some other individuals as well. But at the end of the day, uh, we did talk to 133 individuals, some representing themselves personally, others representing organizations, and we had 
several meetings, such as the one that you hosted with uh, with a larger group of people all uh, gathered together at the same time. We tried to ask the same questions of everyone, so that the so that the results that we got um, would would be uh, uh, usable by by Facebook. Uh, and uh, when we finished that first tranche of interviews, we uh, gathered our team together and uh, basically asked the question, all right, what does this tell us? And because we had uh, categorized everything very, very carefully, we were able to divide the comments that we received into six separate categories of concerns. And I think that was useful because the way we presented it to Facebook then, it wasn't just war stories from conservatives that were mad at Facebook. It was here are six specific areas that the criticisms seem to all fall into, and we had subsets to it as well, and and documented it so that uh, when Facebook got our preliminary findings, they had a very good sense of what the most important conservatives in the country uh, felt about Facebook, and in particular what kind of biases they thought Facebook had. That's what they wanted, uh, a very candid assessment of conservative attitudes so that they could then decide what, if anything, they wanted to do with that. I'll also uh, point out that we told everybody that we interviewed that, first of all, we weren't lobbying for Facebook. We were there to gather information, not make a case uh, on behalf of Facebook. And secondly, we uh, told them that we would not disclose their names, uh, uh, that, that they would remain anonymous so that... Um, we hoped in that way to get the most candid assessments possible, and I think that did help. Uh, th- there are some who, who don't mind uh, uh, letting the public know that they were interviewed, but others, I think, were uh, were very candid with us because they knew that we would keep their identities uh, private. And so one of the criticisms I note uh, from some people that responded to my op-ed was, well, you didn't name the names. Well, there's a good reason for that. We in the, in the spirit of trying to get the most candid information, uh, we told folks that we wouldn't mention their name. Well, you mentioned your op-ed you wrote for the Wall Street Journal this week in which you provide a link. Uh, the full report is available for uh, the public to read. Uh, we also included it in our news coverage on The Daily Signal, so encourage our listeners who might be interested in learning more. I wanted you to go through those six categories, if you wouldn't mind. I think on a, on a very broad level, high level, it would be important uh, to hear about uh, how, why and how you decided to, to settle on those. Well, the, the reason was because... Um When we looked at all of the data that we had received, um, it was pretty clear, uh, you know, what what the nature of the the concerns were, and and they fell into these categories. And we thought that the best way to to get to to be useful for Facebook uh, was to be able to uh, relay it to their policies or procedures, so that they would know uh, uh, what to look, where to look internally. Uh, if they wanted to respond to these concerns. So, uh, for example, on ad policies, we broke it down into the ad policies and the way that it was, uh, inf- the ad policies were enforced. Those were two of the categories. And uh, they were able to go right to their policies and basically connect up the complaints that we received uh, with the policies. And, of course, they had to undergo some assessment of how um, valid the information was uh, and, uh, you know, we weren't uh, asked, uh, as a firm, we weren't asked to uh, to determine the, the validity of all of the complaints. We, we would have had to go into Facebook and, and uh, you know, look through all of their algorithms and decisions that they made and so on and connect it up with the individual complaints, and that obviously was beyond the scope of what we were asked to do. But Facebook had an opportunity to do that at least at a high level, and so they could, they could determine that... Uh, in in these six specific areas where they heard complaints, um, they could match that up with their policies and their procedures and get some kind of an idea of uh, whether they thought it worth responding to and whether they thought the complaints probably had some merit. And by the way, they they made the point to us that even though they might disagree that that some of these complaints had merit, that they didn't really reflect bias, they understood that perceptions are part of the problem. And uh, even uh, if not every single complaint could be authenticated, 
the fact that people thought this about Facebook was enough for Facebook to take a good hard look at their policies to see what, if anything, that they wanted to change. The title of your Wall Street Journal piece is Why Conservatives Don't Trust Facebook. My independent team of investigators looked into the complaints and the company has taken action. Facebook did come out with its own blog post at the same time as your op-ed, and they talked about some of the changes they've made. Uh, do you want to share what uh, what you were able to to do in terms of bringing forward some of the concerns and how they have taken action? When we uh, presented our, our findings, um, we this was to a group of Facebook people with whom we had been working from the very beginning. And by the way, um, uh, several of these people were well-known in the conservative community themselves. Uh, so we were not working with uh, with a bunch of California liberals. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just be real crass about putting it that way because that's kind of the way a lot of the conservatives view Facebook. Uh, we we were also dealing with uh, folks within the company who really wanted to get to the bottom of this. And so we had ongoing conversations. As we began to get these results, we, we told uh, the folks at Facebook what we were beginning to find. Uh, we talked to them about uh, how what categorizations would be the most useful to them. Uh, and that process continued. Um, uh, for, for long after we actually submitted the first uh, tranche of findings to them. And then we did follow-up interviews, and we discussed with them ideas that we developed internally that they might want to consider to respond to some of these concerns. And uh, it was an iterative process. It wasn't uh, like we uh, made a, a series of formal recommendations uh, but rather, when we got some of these complaints, we sat down with them and said, well, what do you think? Is this something you might want to look into? And here's some ideas about maybe um, responding to these concerns. And they took that back to their headquarters and would come back and say, yeah, our folks really do want us to look into this. Or no, they don't think that'll work. But in any event, it was an iterative process that went on uh, really for a year. And uh, during that period of time, as I say, we did follow-up interviews and shared those results with them as well. And... Um, we did discuss uh, several of the ideas that they had. For example, one of the uh, things that we reported on and they announced uh, uh, early on was uh, the creation of a special board that, in fact, it would be international. It would have both uh, people from the United States as well as other places where Facebook is. And uh, th this board uh, would be very diverse and uh, would hopefully be able to uh, uh, act as a final arbiter on some of the complaints or appeals that, that come to Facebook as a result of decisions that it's made. Um, we gave them recommendations for people uh, who the conservative community would, would find uh, trustworthy uh, as members of that board. And uh, so, it, as I say, it was an iterative process as we went along. We're trying to be as helpful as we can to not only report what we hear from conservatives, but to give them some ideas about what we think might work to ameliorate the concerns. And we hope to be able to continue that process moving forward as Facebook uh, dives into additional changes that they think they may want to make. Looking at that oversight board that you mentioned, of course, Facebook is headquartered in one of the most liberal areas of the country. This is a complaint conservatives often raise about the leadership of the company. Do you, uh, looking at the ideological diversity that they have promised uh, for this board, uh, do you feel that there's a commitment on their part to achieving that right balance and fairness? Well, obviously, the proof will be in the pudding, and no one will be totally satisfied, I'm sure. Um but I, what I can say is that uh, I've talked to people at the highest levels of the company, and they have the very best of intentions. And uh, if, if they can uh, make this work so that uh, they can mostly satisfy most of the people all around the world, uh, that'll be quite an achievement. But I know that's their goal. Senator, uh, of course, in the middle of this process, uh, you um, filled the seat of the late John McCain in September of 2018, shortly after you delivered your preliminary results to Facebook. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a massive undertaking that, that you were able to take on here in terms of the number of interviews and, uh, and the complexity of the issues. I imagine it's also something you probably didn't need to take on. But personally, why did you decide that it was important for you to be involved in surfacing some of these concerns that conservatives do have? Well, first of all, Facebook 
book is a client of Covington and Burling and a very uh, uh, a, a very trusted uh, group of, of folks work together uh, from our firm and and uh, at Facebook and uh, we wanted to try to be able to support uh, our client but secondly uh, when uh, Bill Wickerman and I talked about this we saw an opportunity to try to do some good here uh, we were already aware that there was a great deal of skepticism, if not cynicism, on the right about Facebook policies. And we felt that if we could listen to those and, and, and present them to Facebook so that Facebook would know that this isn't just something that occasionally somebody says on TV or, or writes, uh, but it is a very real phenomenon. And given the fact that we knew Facebook wants to be trusted by its users, and conservatives are major users of Facebook, that they would probably want to do something about um, the findings that we uh, got from our interviews, we decided it would be a real good opportunity, not just for Facebook, but also um, uh, to potentially respond to these conservative criticisms so that Facebook could continue to be a trusted platform by conservatives. You know, we a lot of conservatives are of the view you can't trust the mainstream media very much, and Facebook offered a place where you could express yourself very candidly and very thoroughly and, and to an audience and um, and get your message out that way. And uh, so Facebook has been used by conservatives for that purpose. And uh, Bill and I thought, well, this is a chance to both uh, help Facebook restore some of that trust, but also... Uh, provide a voice for conservatives that they had lacked uh, before then, but that we could uh, amplify to Facebook so that they knew full full well what the conservative complaints really were. Well, on that note, you uh, write in the report, uh, quote, Facebook has recognized the importance of our assessment and has taken some steps to address the concerns we uncovered, but there is still significant work to be done to satisfy the concerns we heard from conservatives. What would you say some of the work that they need to do going forward to appease some of the conservatives might be? Well, it, it all boils down to one word, trust. And, and they know this. Now, whether they can do enough to, uh, to regain that trust among all conservatives, that, that'd be a pretty tall order. But they know they need to try. And uh, their initial um, reaction and, and changes that they've announced are certainly steps in that direction. Now, I would not argue that those are uh, major, significant uh, actions on the part of Facebook, uh, but more um, their effort to try to quickly respond to, uh, I don't want to use the word low-hanging fruit, really, but things that they could that they could address, that they understood the conservatives were concerned about, and they could fairly uh, quickly address those things, and they wanted to show that good faith. But they understand that there's a lot more that they're going to have to do to restore the good, uh, the, the, the trust uh, if uh, conservatives will continue to be major users of, of, their, uh, of their facilities. Um, it's, I, I, I don't want to suggest that um, the information we've given them uh, has been uh, fully uh, taken on board in the sense that Facebook agrees with it all, uh, they have in some instances said, well, it's easy to complain, but you have to understand the tough job we have of monitoring literally millions of sites all around the world every day. And and we do make mistakes. Nick Clegg, who's been brought on board by Facebook to really uh, head up this project, uh, had a blog post a couple of days ago in which he said, <laughs> You have to understand, we make mistakes, and um, so we, we acknowledge that. We're going to do our best to, to try to avoid that, but uh, with all of the posts that are made every day and some of the very difficult, very fine uh, decisions that have to be made, it's, it, it's not easy to please everyone, and I, I accept that. So, so they're not going to just say, well, whatever the conservatives' complaints are, We'll, we'll try to respond to them because they have a much larger audience than that. But I do know that they understand they need to try to restore that trust with as many conservatives as, as possible because they are very large users 
and they want a good reputation uh, as as an entity that's fair. And speaking of that, that trust and the, the issues involved there, uh, the Daily Signal, I can speak from experience, has itself uh, seen its content pulled down at times uh, from, from Facebook. I think can think of a specific video of a pediatrician, a doctor who uh, warned about the dangers of giving puberty blockers to young children. That video went viral. It has over 74 million views. Uh, for a period of time, uh, it disappeared from Facebook. Uh, we, we contacted Facebook and it took a couple of weeks, but they did restore that video. And uh, and I think that that's uh, an issue that other conservatives have faced and uh, and why I think it's so important uh, for them to at least have people who are in touch and and in communication with conservatives as they might encounter uh, some of these challenges. Now, well, that's yeah, go ahead. Let me just make a point on that. One of the criticisms we heard uh, from some of the medium sized and smaller Facebook users was, well, if you're a big outfit like Heritage, for example. Uh, you can go right to people that you know in Facebook and plead your case, and and they might well uh, restore in this in this case uh, the, the item that had been pulled down. But for the smaller groups and the mid-sized groups, it's not as easy to get your appeal heard. And we thought that sounded plausible. Presented it to Facebook, and they said, you know, you're right. It's just a question of manpower, but we'll devote some. We'll hire some more people, and we will devote. Um, these folks specifically to the smaller and mid-sized folks that have complaints. So it's not just uh, the, the big national organizations like Heritage that can have a voice, but also uh, we'll we'll try to help the smaller ones as well. Now, whether that's enough, whether it'll really work, I don't know, but at least it shows that they tried to respond to a criticism that we thought was fair. In your report, you also mentioned the concerns that conservatives raised over the issue of hate speech and the hate speech policy. Uh, Facebook and other tech companies have relied on organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, which deems a lot of what I would consider mainstream conservative groups as hate groups. And Facebook, um, of course, is uh, no different than some of these other companies and that it also has a hate speech policy. What were you hearing from conservatives that you talked to about their concerns specifically regarding this issue? Well, I, I can just summarize it in, into, into two categories. Uh, one, groups that felt that they were discriminated against because of these kinds of characterizations. And secondly, at a broader level, um, the, the view expressed by a lot of conservatives was the of hate speech to begin with is fraught with potential dangers. And if you're an entity like Facebook, um, you're going to be having decisions that may actually cast, uh, that may, may get into people's motivations, and that's a very tricky business to do. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, the the basic idea from a lot of the conservatives was try to stay away from these categorizations of hate because you don't know whether somebody has hate in their heart or not. Now, whether whether Facebook can deal with that in a way that's satisfactory to the whole political spectrum, I don't know. But at least I, I know they got an earful from the conservatives on that point. Now, of course, Senator, uh, this is uh, a country that is deeply divided after all. So we, we heard both criticism from conservatives and uh, liberals uh, in the wake of your report. Uh, some conservatives, Brent Bozell of the Media Research, for instance, said that it fails to admit fault or wrongdoing. Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri said, quote, merely asking somebody to listen to conservatives concerns isn't an audit. It's a smokescreen disguised as a solution. What message would you like to Leave with those well, concerns. I, I, I would tell Senator Hawley this. Remember what we were asked to do. Conservatives didn't think that their voice was being heard. Facebook knew that there was a lot of concern and unrest out there in the conservative community, but they didn't really know uh, how serious it was and what the conservatives were really saying. So they hired somebody that was a conservative who could talk to these folks and receive candidly the responses back because Facebook wanted an unvarnished, truthful response. What exactly are conservatives saying? What do we need to know here? That's what they hired us to do. They didn't hire us to fix the problem, as we couldn't do that. Um, and and I've, I've been a little disappointed by, by folks who don't appreciate the value of simply getting the conservative complaints heard. I mean, it's not easy with a great big company like like Facebook with all the other stuff that they're doing. Um, but they at least recognized the fact that they were missing information that they needed, and they hired us to get that information. So I would say to Senator Hawley, 
appreciate what we did. Now, that doesn't mean that all the problems are solved, but it certainly wasn't intended to be a smokescreen. If if uh, Facebook isn't able to assuage a lot of these concerns and and to deal with with fair complaints by conservatives, then you can make your complaint. But um, but and until then, give at least give them a chance to to respond and recognize that their good faith in wanting to at least hear what conservatives had to say. Uh, I'll say, for example, I, I don't think that uh, Senator Cruz uh, would mind if I acknowledge the fact that he's one of the people we talked to because he had been an outspoken critic of all of these uh, platforms. Um, and uh, so we asked him uh, all the questions. What what do you think? And he was very good, very candid, and, and had very specific information for us that I was pleased to pass to really showed an important person who was very disappointed in a platform that he originally uh, had thought um, it could be a real good uh, outlet example. And um, so I, I think, and, and he responded by at least expressing some appreciation for the fact that, that his views were, that they got through to the people in Facebook. And, and uh, that's what we were trying to achieve. And I know we did achieve that much now, you know, as to what all happens with it. Uh, as I say, that'll remain to be seen, but at least give them a chance, is, I guess, would be my message. Of course, I don't want people to think that conservatives were the only ones uh, to criticize. There there were conservatives who were complimentary of the work that you did and the fact that you were surfacing these issues. But some on the left said that Facebook was giving legitimacy to the complaints from conservatives simply by asking you to investigate them. So, sure. you know, there there was uh, there was sharp criticism on the left uh, who, who would rather have these issues uh, probably brushed aside and, and not addressed at all. Right, exactly, and that's to be expected. I, I knew that uh, that the left would say, "Well, don't listen to those conservatives. Uh, you know, they don't have anything useful to say." I, I figured we'd get it from there. I was a little disappointed that some of the conservatives didn't at least acknowledge that it was a good thing for for the conservative community writ large to have a voice and to have that expressed in a very candid and and thorough way to the uh, to the leadership of Facebook. Uh, but you know, pe- people have their own uh, their own uh, agendas, and and that's fine. All I know is that we were able to to get some good uh, good information to Facebook, and uh, and we're very hopeful. We, we we know they understand the need for that information because they asked us to get it, and we're very hopeful that they will make good use of it. Senator, I have a final question for you, uh, looking ahead to something that Facebook is planning to roll out later this year. Um, in your op-ed, you note that in 2016, Facebook employees were accused of suppressing conservative articles from the news feeds discontinued uh, trending section. Uh, I joined our former Heritage Foundation president, Jim DeMint, for a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Facebook's headquarters back in 2016 to talk about that issue. Uh, in recent days, Facebook has announced that it is planning to roll out an update or a new news section on the platform. I guess a small team of journalists that Facebook will hire are going to pick the top stories uh, for that section. Uh, You've heard in recent days some conservatives express concern, including the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., who said, quote, because what everyone really needs is Facebook giving even more power and control to establishment corporate media hacks. Uh, So what advice as Facebook prepares to do this would you have for them to make sure that they are treating conservatives fairly? going forward? Well, I, uh, I think just pretty much the same thing that we've uh, told them in the past. You now know, you have before you a, a very thorough compilation of conservative concerns. Uh, you appreciate the fact that they are very skeptical and in some regards even cynical. Uh, you have to restore the trust. They know that. And so um, throughout this process, I think they will be mindful of the fact that the kind of people they selected to do this um, will have to be trusted. And again, the proof will be in the pudding. If when they come out with their product, conservatives uh, view it and say, wait a minute, this is no better than what existed before. Well, then they will not have succeeded, at least with the conservative community. So I I would ask uh, conservatives, based upon the past, be skeptical. But uh, hold your cynicism. <laughs> you know they're trying, and if you don't think they they match up to what you want them to do, then continue to to criticize. That's what I said in the op ed. They fully expect to continue to be um, to, to to get feedback, and it, a lot of it will be negative. And and we think that's a good thing, and we have encouraged conservatives to continue that. So 
They expect it, and we encourage it, but we hope that it'll be constructive criticism based upon skepticism and real real things, just assuming that something is going to be bad before you give it a chance to work. Well, Senator, we appreciate you spending the time with The Daily Signal to go over the report, the process that you use to collect the information and uh, some of the hopes that you have for Facebook and its future relationship with its conservative users. Well, it's it's been a a real pleasure for us to be able to reconnect with a lot of our conservative friends and and to get their ideas. And we encourage them to continue to express those uh, directly to Facebook or or to us. We'll, We'll certainly pass them on. I can guarantee you that. Senator John Kyle, his article for the Wall Street Journal is called Why Conservatives Don't Trust Facebook. Uh, You can find a link to the full report in that op-ed. You can also find it on DailySignal.com. Senator Kyle, thanks again for joining us. You're very welcome. I appreciate the interview. Thank you. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for listening to the Daily Signal podcast brought to you from the Robert H. Bruce Radio Studio at the Heritage Foundation. Please be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or SoundCloud, and please leave us a review or rating on iTunes to give us feedback. Rob and Virginia will be with you on Monday. The Daily Signal podcast is executive produced by Kate Trinko and Daniel Davis. Sound designed by Lauren Evans and Thalia Rampersad. For more information, visit DailySignal.com.